Uh, welcome again to Decolonizing Dance Writing, and this is the last um, uh, artist workshop in the series. Uh, Decolonizing Dance Writing started five, well, almost a year ago when I had this idea for, um, and COVID did this, right? It allowed for new imaginings, new, 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 new thoughts, or for new ways of engaging, different ways of engaging, I should say, not new, um, intentional ways of engaging. Um, but I want, I was really interested in the and I have been for a while in how dance is taught in academic institutions, what's missing, um, what gets taught, what is valued. And being a Black man from Jamaica, I worked, I, I didn't see myself in the dance history that was taught, right? Um, and it was called dance history, not ballet history, not modern history, dance history. And the implications behind that, right? Suggesting that dance is only. Um, and so, Throughout my grad school years, my, my teaching years, I always felt, felt like there was something missing and I didn't know how to properly advance the conversation. When it became possible to say, okay, what if um, we were supposed to gather these international artists, right? Peru, Sri Lanka, um, Colombia, uh, New Zealand, and Ghana, and we were supposed to engage with them about their practices and to then see how we can integrate or interweave that into what is actually taught, how can we advance conversations, discourse around dance, not only in the academy, but dance on professional stages, dance in communities, dance as a phenomenon, right? And I am very pleased with what it has been. I'm very pleased with the, the interviews, how the writers have actually dug a little deeper into in terms of understanding where decolonization lives and how it shows up. And I'm really excited about ending it with Emmanuel. Um, I think the, the, the Africanness of it is something that really speaks to me um, because any, any time that Africa shows up, it, it there's an intentionality towards decentering whiteness, I think. I'm, not that they're not white Africans, I know that to be true. I'm simply saying just that the idea of Africa does something to the discourse and the possibilities of unraveling certain narratives. And so I'm really excited about having Emmanuel um, speak with us, share with us, and I'm gonna have him introduce himself um, and then he'll have the Zoom floor. Thank you so much. Please can you hear me. It's a great honor to be part of this wonderful project. Uh, Professor King, I like that word, King, and the thinking team, it's always a pleasure. Uh, as it was pasted uh, on many platforms, um, I'm a PhD dance student at Temple University. And before that, uh, I attended University of Ghana, Legon, to pursue theater art and dance studies. And when I had my master's in uh, African studies, that is where I had a turning point of my life. And then as I got that seed, I was more hungry for more knowledge. So I traveled all the way to uh, Europe to pursue dance knowledge. And traveling across Europe, I was being challenged in so many ways, in a very positive way. And then from there, as usual, Ghana, you can teach without a PhD. So I, I, I was thinking about the possibilities of trying to get a PhD program. And I hear Professor Charidos came around in France. I went to this temple to us and then uh, here I am on temple and I'm always done my fourth year. I want to thank everybody who's, who's here, Professor Asante Molefe, my ancestors, my colleagues, temple faculty, Elizabeth, thank you for coming. And Kevin, my wife is here, Sandra Kujo. She's here as well. She's my backbone, I'm very grateful that she's supporting me. And all my colleagues and all my students, thank you so much. So when I say ago, you say ame. Ago. Ame. Ago. Ame. 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 Ago. Ame. 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 Awesome. So uh, normally, normally when you get to uh, family homes, you just barge in like that. You ask for permission to enter. In Europe, in America, you, have, you press uh, the bell. The doorbell. And so in our context, I go, I mean, I go, I mean. So as you are decolonizing, that's right. Let's start from there. Great. So uh this little about myself as I, I shared over there. Um I'm looking at decolonizing dance writing, exploring Afrocentricity within Akan Kitty dance heritage. Why the word Afrocentricity? 
why the word decolonizing, dance writing. That's, these are very key words I will explore more. If I'm talking too fast, let me know so that I'll slow down. I have a very wonderful accent. So I want to keep it like that. You see the, uh, the photo, human head. It wasn't there just for beautification. Yeah, it's very multi-layered. See their books stuck every level. And that was me growing up, uh, going through all this schooling process. Theater, art, dance, when I completed performing at that time, 2013, I knew less about myself as a Ghanaian because the curriculum was very uh, colonized. Yes, and then for that matter, I, I was very concerned about how I will build up my, my heritage and my identity. So that took that as I said earlier on. And as I journeyed through my life in, uh, in dancing, acting, and teaching, I, I was struck by Molefik Asante book and then Mama Kariamu's book, African Culture, when I was doing my master's. And that gave me kind of a hope that I can really look at dance from a different perspective. And so after that book, I knew there was a, a gap within our scholarship. So I applied to be at a Coromondus program that gave me more knowledge about dance, anthropology, and ethnocoreology and cultural heritage. And that was where I realized that it is time to, to turn my research internally to reassess my knowledge and, and my, my way forward. So if you see my eye section, there's a book stack there. And that's where I am come to present tonight or today, wherever you are in a continent or in a country. And I'm going to within the African lens. So there will be some words that will be very maybe uncomfortable or because I'm coming from that perspective. It might not be very comfortable in your thinking or in your maybe in your engagement. Uh, it's, it's a way of learning as well. So now fast forward. Let me my outline. Okay, the dance epistemology, dancing, dancing event, uh, performance of heritage. I will ask questions that we all think about. And I'll look at Afrocentricity as a paradigm in decolonizing dance and analysis and the conclusion. I must say that I'm going to do this in two sections. One will be a PowerPoint and then that will be like the, the present, like I mean the, 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 the workshop, the practical part of it. So in a nutshell, let's look at Asante cosmology, the dance and the music position. So according to Asante point of view, not Asante as a scholar, I'll get to him very soon. Asante, Asante is, uh, they believe in God, lesser gods, music and dance, social hierarchy, and social order. This is part of Asante cosmology. And within this cosmology, music and dance play a very critical role in how they see cosmology. And within this music, music and dance section, instruments and vocal elements are very paramount when they are talking about Asante cosmology. I'll go deeper into that aspect as I proceed. Within the Asante music and dance court, uh, there are various types of, of dances. We have social dance, court, ritual, or religious dances. We have war dances. We have royal dances. Which kitty is an a royal dance? Royal dance. They are performed during royal rituals, both indoors and outdoors. So if you see the picture, it is a wonderful Ghanaian ladies trying to display uh, knowledge, history, ideals through the dance movement. Wanting to understand that when we talk about dances from Africa, I'm using my words carefully. Dances from Africa, not African dance. Uh, I'm saying that because there's a lot of misconception about the word African dance. And I don't think it, it would be appropriate to lump all 55 countries into one box and give them a name tag African dance. We have many dances in the continent. I'm not sure I've come across a dance for Asian dance or European dance or South American dance. And so it's very interesting to see how we interrogate such names, but maybe I might use them for purposes of understanding, but I want to throw out that it's very problematic as well. They are usually performed at Cheese Palace. This, I mean, the Kete dance. 
I must say that Kete is a royal dance and it was owned by the Asante monarchy, the Asante Hene, or two four city to open so. You see, I just will rose from my chair. When I mention his name, I can't sit down and, and mention his name because I see him as my overlord, as an Asante person. And, but after the independence, the Kete left the palace to many places. And I'm looking at this Kete dance in my dissertation here at Temple University, where I'm tracing the dance from the palace to the amateur category, to the professional dance company, and to the academy. I am a living proof and I perform under all these categories. So I draw my lived experience. That's why I'm deploying phenomenology, some of my methodological lens to look at these experiences. They also used to entertain the chiefs as well as welcome visitors. This is when it was within the palace, but now it can also be used in other contexts as, as I have, have indicated. They use us, they use a semiotic system of communication. I will talk more on that as I, as, as I proceed. Uh, the chains, um, the beads uh, on your ankle, on your knee, the kinte cloth, wide extension of their butt. These are all very symbolic. The headgear is not just for beautification. They are, they are coded. In them are enshrined philosophies and ideals of the Asante people. On the royal dances, we have quantum form and Kito Dakans. War dances. The performance was reserved for men. That's in the olden days. They regulate the different units for the community. Uh, I must say before the introduction of police, mil military, and other uh, security personnel within the shores of Africa, or the, the system to adapt that system. And there was a way that people are uh, safeguarded and protected, defended uh, their people. And one of the greatest people I can mention is Ya Asantoa, a great warrior who stood uh, for the defense of Asante Empire against uh, the British uh, rule. Uh, they provide a uh, performance, emotional, spiritual, psychological, and physical preparedness for battle. These war dances are very important because within these dances, I enshrined uh, certain words that boost your emotions and really help you with your psychological uh, instability as well. Women are now allowed to perform them due to organization. I must state that within the African context, uh, there are clear indication of certain rules people can do. I'm not saying that uh, one cannot cross the line to do other stuff. We evolve and they evolve, that they evolve within the cultural parameters. In the olden days, when a sentiment are going for war, because during the uh, pre-colonial time, and even the colonial time, and the more you fight to get territory, the more you, your, your power increases. So you fight to get more people, you, you, you capture more lands, so that you can be very powerful. And so war was one of the ways to spread your tentacles as, 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 as an ethnic group. And so we see many war between the Asantes, the Akwamu, the other ethnic groups. And when the, when the men are going to the battlefield, the women will stay behind and take in charge of the whole community. So from the onset, it's very clear that women play a very critical role within the Asante, <clears throat> not, only Asante not only Asante community, but other, other places as well. You see the women carrying mortar and pistol. When I say mortar and pistol, it's not about like pistol like a gun. It's just a tall uh, carved uh, wood. Chrysella, when I say I'm talking about, and a mortar is like they pound it. If you are familiar with a Nigerian eba food or fufu, that's what we used to pound. So when the women are pounding that mortar and that pistol, it's a typology and a spiritual connotation that they are crushing the enemies as their men are at the war front, fighting physically. They are attack, they are handling this thing spiritually. But if you are not privy to such information or you are not, you don't have a cultured ear, you might ascribe your own judgment or interpretation to what they are doing. Asafu of that can and then from, from, from these are war dances, social dances. They are recreational forms usually regarded as leisure and activities. Uh, their participation is, is open to general public. They are used as a medium of education as well as social criticism. So there, were, there was a way that dances within Ghana or Africa were used, but in this case, uh, Asante's were used to correct social norms and 
deviant people in societies. And as, as I realized that dance is not just movement, it goes beyond the movement aspect. If I should quote uh, Sheik Johnson, he argues that uh, movement is a source of knowledge. And if I should quote Professor uh, G.H. Katia, Professor, Professor Kuvo, these are renowned scholars that have written a lot about African dance. And they have attested that African movement or dance from Africa goes beyond uh, the, 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 the first value. So we, call it, we have a dance called Sichi, and I said here, yeah. you can look at Asante dance and you can tell the social hierarchy of these people, just the movement, the songs, the costume, the artifacts, the drum, and all that. Court dances. Looking at this picture alone, you can have a lot of interpretation, but I'll not, I'll not go into that, but that's not my focus. But I thought I should lay this foundation very clear for people to understand. They regulate religious and spiritual dimensions of life. You see the chief priestess with the aquafina. Aquafina is the one that's, that's being held by her right hand. What is you what is used to swear allegiance to the king or an oath? So it's a very critical tool as she's holding it. Because in the olden days, a chief, a king, a chief priest, and a drummer, these are three components that are needed in a society. A king. The chief priest or chief priestess and the drama, Dr. Chalama. You see the raffia skirt, leaves are around, around the neck, powder, all those things. These are these are ways that enhances uh, the movement as, as, as she dances. The performance is strictly by membership. You can't just join because you love it, you are in tune to it. You must go through schooling, traditional way of schooling. You are being schooled and to get into that. They often become the means through which members reach God. As I said in our central cosmology, they believe in God. They know how to talk to, to their God. And these are mediums that they communicate through their God. Example is a form of the can dance. I've had an encounter whereby one of the students we were in class and we were being taught in academy. And somebody got possessed in class when we we're learning this dance. And it was really amazing to see such an encounter because we are, we are coming from other homes and we are now in the city across learning this movement. But I realized that the person that got possessed had a trace from, he has a calm background in her village. So when she, she was dancing and she opened up her spirit, the deities came to dwell within her and manifested. And now ritual scholars who attest to the fact that this, this, this happens a lot within the African uh, uh, society. I want to use this uh, diagram that is used by Professor Kuvo, the only dance anthropologist in Ghana at the moment, and even extension to Africa as well. Who we, was my supervisor, and similar supervisor during my master's level. He propounded this concept, holistic nature of dances from Africa. Here again, I said, dances from Africa. According to him, movement and gestures manifest through the body, the dancing body. So combination of movements, you will get gestures. I'll, I'll talk about Wakanda movement very soon as I move. The Wakanda, Wakanda movement has been tran truncated to what we have has to be like this, but you realize that it has its source within Asante uh, movement systems. He also argues that sound instrumentations, songs, rhythms, and vibrations are being displayed within our music. So when you're looking at music from Africa, don't just look at the tonality or the sound alone. Look at the vibration, the songs, and the rhythm that comes from the musical instrument. These are all methods that we can decolonize our dance writing. When I say dance writing, I'm talking about only pen and paper. But when you are choreographed, you are writing, you are ascribing to your body. Because our body uh, is a political site for display. And our body is an archive. So within our body, we can really exhibit, inhibit, store, and inherit so many cultural knowledge. He also uh, argues that kinesthetic senses include balance and internal feelings are displayed through the multi-sensory modality. So as 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 non-African, if you are looking at this dance, 
And I want to use the term African born in a diaspora, and African born in a continent for the purpose of this presentation. But you can also hear me using African, African American. So pardon me if I'm using this interchangeably. This was very clear when I, 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 I met Mama Karim World Asante, my great mentor, when she was teaching Mufundala. Abba, eh? these sounds are not just sounds. These are internal feelings that cannot be documented by any other movement systems. These are parts of dances that we are not paying attention to. Even African scholars and African American scholars, we are more into the movement aspect of it. We don't pay attention to these internal feelings. Well, these are part and parcel of this uh, our dances that we are not paying attention to. Visual forms, I saw the picture, costume, shape designs, special object patterns, and colors. Why do you see the kitchen drums covered with red and black? Why not white? Why not green? The red and black is, is very symbolic. When you look at the etymology of the Kitty dance, where it came from, uh, there are many schools of thought that was captured through war, captured through uh, um, deities and all that. But the bottom line or the co commonality between all these various schools of thought uh, boils down to the fact that it was gotten through battles and sharing the blood. So the red stands for blood. Esum ni muja. Esum means darkness. And muja means blood. So we have these kitty drums due to the fight and the battles that we went to and other, other people died for us to get these drums. So as an Asante, looking at the drums alone, I have a lot of connotation to that. Why do we carve the drums that way? Why that way? Why is it called Apentima, Petia, Abrukua, Akwadum? These are the drum sets that I'm talking about. The other Kodum is the main, the, the, the master drum. But because of time, I'll not go deep into that aspect. So when you're looking at these uh, African dancers dance from Africa, we must pay attention to want to decolonize all this kind of perspective. We should really have, we should really have a, a very good time to really pay attention to every single part of the fiber of these dances. There have been a lot of, uh, argument about non-Africans non writing about African dances. Yes, early anthropologists did that, very clear. But the point is, that's what they saw. Even though they looked through that, they looked at them through their lenses, which for me is very problematic. We as Africans born in and out of the continent also should pay attention to things like that. So dance in Africa goes beyond uh, a body and space, extending to music, Movement, language, symbolism, philosophy, religion, cosmogony, science, technology, and institutions, as I've highlighted. So now, theorizing Kete dance from an indigenous perspective. What am I talking about indigenous perspective? To decolonize the racial methodology is to argue that people must enter the world from the path of their historically and culturally developed perspective. By Akbar. There's a need to approach dance if you're looking at African dances or as, 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 as a Ghanaian looking at Ghana, Kete dance. My first call is to look at a dance from a cultural perspective. And that's what I'm leaving for my dissertation. As a part of Kabbalah Kete, our stories are our theories and our methods. These are ways that we can write about our stories, our dances. We should look for our stories, look for our mates and all those things. We will have knowledge, we will be able to decode and have access to ways of writing our own dances. I argue that these are banks, these are storehouse, this is the hub where knowledge and stories are stored and can retrieve to serve our purpose against any other. So in a nutshell, I am proposing that we should look at our dancing from an indigenous perspective. Well, they are there. Just that we are not paying attention and we are looking elsewhere to get ideas and concepts to justify your own dance. I'm not saying it's wrong to look, to look somewhere else, very important. We live in 
interdisciplinary community, we need each other to share our knowledge. But if there's a way you can source outside information to write about your people, I argue that you must, that's your first point of call. So generally, generally I'm talking about linguistic structures and get language. Example, a switch or quite a quantum soup, a penny one, a switch or quite a quantum soup, a penny one, a ball quantum cut to a swoon, a swoon effected. A swoon no effected or the monkuma or the monkma was soon effected. This is a drum language, a kitty language that are drummed by the master drummer. What am I talking about? Let me let me decode it. The river was created by God, likewise, the road. But we, 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 we cultivate or we cut the path to meet the river. We don't direct the river to the path. Who is the eldest? This is what is being played at the beginning of a syndicated dance. Why am I talking about rivers and, 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 and roads? What, what, what is the connection? As scientists believe that they have been existing ever since the world was created and they are the river. And any other people who try to get to them, they must be very cautious because they, they existed before you came. So as an Asante person, listening to this drum language, it gives me a lot of spiritual and psychological uh, advantage when I understand what, it, what is being played. And I must say that I performed this dance at the age of six years old to now, 27 years of my life doing this dance. And as I said, I was born and raised in a palace and my dad was a sub chief. So growing up within the royal parameters, there are certain knowledge I was privy to as, 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 as I, was, I was growing up. So it's a metaphor and proverbs. These are ways that we can, we can source for knowledge, source for methods. In, in, in decolonizing our, our dance writing, artifacts and the costume. Why the Kente costume? It's one of the highest form of costume among Asante people. The songs. This is a chi asante language. It's a chant song that I play when I'm about to play the kitty on the front of front. It talks about Asantis must take the principal street, the main street. We must take up the main street and to fight and defend our land, irrespective of what will confront us. Our life is on the line. We must protect the dignity, the heritage, the monarchy of Asante people. Stories are made. I can go on and go on and go on. Communitarian approach. This is Asante here at the moment. And look at where he's seated. He has bodyguards, the clothes, the horn, the cross symbols, the drum, somewhere with a cloth. Connection between individual and a community. Whatever that we are doing within our dance forms is a reflection of what happens in the community. Nobody stands as an idol. Nobody owns everything as an idol. Nobody owns everything individually. It is a collaborative work. It's a collective work. We all own it. So with this Edin Kras symbol, Matthias here, that's on a cloth. That same Matthias here is on this front of a drum. Uh, the Sankofa buried. Jin Yami, and so on and so forth. These are methods, these are concepts that can be developed in decolonizing our, our dance research. And so when you see these Edin Kras symbols, on our clothes, on our drums, tangibly there, 
It can be danced as well within Kitty Dance and Center Forms, which I'll talk about very soon. Now my question is, how can we decolonize African dance scholarship? There are two ways. African dance scholarship within the continent, a scholarship at the diaspora. Centering the African dancing body as knowledge agent. As King said, teaching African dance in America, in Europe, in Asia, within Africa, and Northern America. I came across a huge gap about how we transfer or transmit or disseminate information to our students. All our performance, the concept and the realization is very important. The concept deals with the knowledge system embedded within the dance. And the realization is the dancing itself. So if you want to really decolonize our dance research, we should go beyond just teaching the movement alone. We must research about what informs the movement. What are the ideals and principles enshrined in such movement? When we are doing that, I believe we are, in, we are, we are on our way of trying to decolonize what we are doing. Employing or exploring Afrocentric paradigm or body under the concept of centeredness. So talking about Kitty Dance, the best option for me as a researcher is to let the dance do the talking. Look internally about the dance. If I try to interpret the dance from non-African lens, I'm, I'm being dislocated. So Asante is advocating for relocation of dance scholars, artists, theater practitioners, whatever that, 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 that uh, uh, informs or, or has connection with African knowledge, you must really interrogate that internally. Two, what are the cultural parameters for teaching dance from Africa in academies in the diaspora? That's one thing I realized. Identifying nuances of each country's dance cultures and applying contextual knowledge in their teaching. They must identify. If you're talking about Ghanaian dance, be specific and don't generalize it as if it is everywhere in Africa. Why am I concerned about the internal issues? If we don't handle the internal issues, we can handle the external issues. So as African scholars, African-American scholars, people of color scholars, let's pay attention within ourselves of how we portray or we talk about our dance forms. And we must support research of dance cultures from all the countries in Africa to help alleviate misconceptions of dance from Africa as a singular form, as I mentioned. There's no dance called African dance from my point of view. Ghana housed more than 200 dancers and they're very different. I'm an Asante, but I'm limited even in Ghana based on dance forms. Understanding that, that, that learning and performing dance from Africa is a long, lifelong journey. Once evolves with the dance knowledge as the college practice. People travel to Africa for three weeks, one month, and they claim to be expert of dance from Africa. And for me, this needs to be interrogated because it's, it's a progressive work. I'm still learning how to dance Kitty after 27 years because the dance evolves over time. Afrocentricity, a viable conceptual framework. Kufo said, dance with its music as an art form has significantly become involved in the process of self-reflection and identity construction in Africa. However, this unique part of the art never been free from colonial and Western influence. Colonizers of Africa, through the lens of their early anthropologists. So I really misunderstood African dance and often used foreign tools to measure its leadings to a of its intrinsic element. And this is very clear. When I was uh, doing my second master's in Europe, my, my program allowed me to really use many theories from different backgrounds. And I was questioning that if I could use other concept. I got into trouble because I was asking for something that maybe it was not thought about or it wasn't part of the program. And that was where I began to really dive deep about what can I use, what tool can I use to really, really write about my dance from my lens. Oh, they are, they are super aggressive. They are very new, naked. 
because you are using your lens or your culture to judge somebody's culture without interrogating how important these things are for them. Huntonji also has said that we should do research from African perspective. Because when we do that, it will help us in our pursuit of research in the future. And so with this viable uh, theory, I now go deeper into what Asante talks about Afrocentricity, as many of you might not be aware of. According to Asante Mlofekete, who is also my supervisor, he said that it's very critical that we place African ideals at the center of any analysis in relation to African culture, very specific African culture and traditions, and this regard music and dance. This was another turning point when I encountered this concept in Ghana and here at Temple. He advocated for the restoration of true dignity of African people. And he also argued that the aim is that all cultural center must be respected and not imp impaired by color or geography. So he's not arguing that we should downplay or relegate other, other forms, but he's arguing that we should look at them in parallel to know that there's other forms of knowledge that must be known as well. So I've a paradigm, locate research from an Af African point of view and create Africans' own intellectual perspective. If you want to own our dances, our dance knowledge, if you want to decolonize dance research, we must be able to create our own, from our own perspective. Focuses on Africa as a cultural center, instead of African experience and interpret research data from an African perspective. African experience, that is phenomenological. Our dances are just a reflection of our activities. Agbaja dance, if you look at the movement, that they, they go backwards like that. When you ask them, they'll tell you that they, they migrated from Nigeria all the way to where they are now. And, and they were trying to run away from a tyrant leader. So their experience were inculcated in the movement system. So if you are not paying for this information, you might oh, they are always doing this. What do you mean of that? They are always repeating their movement. To them, it's, it's quite different because they understand the cultural relevance of what they are doing. So in a nutshell, the centricity paradigm provides methods which African people can use for making sense of their everyday experience. It takes the indigenous African's point of view, but in Kabela, they all build on a scientist uh, perspective. Locating the black dancing body within a centric decolonizing approach. Asante had this location theory that I, I like so much. He go them into two. The decapitated test, test or scholar or writers. According to him, they write with no discerning African cultural elements and aim at distancing himself or herself from, from the African culture. And I've come across many writings like that. You pick a book title, African, da, 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 and when you begin to read, you can't see any connection within the African culture. The lynch test for scholars. They are produced by Africans and African-American authors who have literary skills, but little cultural and historical knowledge. And I said, they are working to more Eurocentric than African. The fact that you can write beautifully does not mean that you are done just the content of the subject matter. And Ugu Watiangu was arguing for recognizing the mind. Right now he's writing Kikui as abandoned English language from his own personal point of view. He believes that if I write in my local language, I can communicate more. So if you're arguing for decolonizing African dance or, or dance um, scholarship, we must be mindful of our text, our writings, as African scholars and African-American scholars. We must really pay attention to the cultural nuances and the social knowledge within these people. Sankofa, Akofina and Jinyami. I will show a video briefly on that, but for that, I want to finish uh, the PowerPoint. Conclusion How can Afrocentric method, as advanced by Sante, be further explored to re reinforce African indigenous culture and epistemology? And how can African centered research refrain from sticking to pathways 
mapped out by colonial and nuclear net structures. I can only answer by saying this, no matter how long a piece of wood stays on water or river, I can never change your crocodile. It doesn't matter how intelligent or how smart you are with deploying or using other theories or concepts. There's one thing about you, I always remind you that you're you an African, you have our African heritage. And it's better you find a stand or start looking within yourself to find a way to talk about yourself or the people. Because as long as this wood stays on water, we can never change its name. They are woods and it's a crocodile. It's a, 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 a camp proverb. It talks about you being real and try to appreciate who you are. Because no matter how you try to try to come like somebody, there's a way you, you, you know that you are not like those people as well. So I suggest that it is critical to seek principles and concepts from Ghanaian African cultural ideologies that can support methods for reaching, for researching indigenous knowledge, knowledge like Asante Kete dance. Uh, on this note, I'll, I'll, I'll look at, I'll, I'll share certain uh, dances that I believe uh, will help us to understand where I'm coming from as a, uh, as, as a Kete dancer. So these are the videos I'll be showing any moment from now. This is a royal dancer. Can you hear the sound? Hello, can you hear the sound? Yes. Yeah, yeah. This guy is dancing. This is the Asante King. That's the Asante King. So just want to highlight a few stuff that was being done over there. Wakanda movement, power. When I see this power movement, it, be, it begins from this. You roll it and place it to your chest. That means in the right and in the left, or from the right, from the, from the left, all power belongs to me. So when I see this Wakanda movement as an Asante person with this movement system, I can deduce that it has linkage within the Asante philosophical and, and opinion that all power belongs to me. And when uh, we do the Jinyame symbol that I show you, when I, you are dancing and you do that and you do this, it means a self got nobody. So that the incredible symbol, as tangible it is, is also intangible within the Kete dances. So we, it's all interconnected. The symbols and the signs, the totem, the proverbs are, are also performed within the Asante uh, dances. For example, you saw the little guy doing this and that. He's little and he's a royal, so he will be pardoned. But normally it's the king who does that movement. And when we are doing that, which will demonstrate very soon, yes. Tafre Ayanda, Tafre is a cockroach. When a cockroach dies, it, it falls two ways, either flat or up. So it's time for how a scientist when they are going to war, they have only two solutions. Either they win or they lose. You know, their life is their life. So this movement, go, dance goes beyond movement. There are deals in them. So we should go, we should look beyond just the movement. When I'm dancing and I begin to do that to the drummers, play for me, I'll give you a drink. I'm communicating that. 
Drums, front and front drummers, were means that we, we convey messages in the villages, not social media or television or, or uh, radio stations. They've set drummers and then meters yards in between the, 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 the village. So when they get a message, they drown. Ghana for Muti, Asamaba, Mombra, 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 Mekutinana, and Ephraim, and Ephraim, Jabrafi, Jabrafi. Stop what you are doing and come. There's a message in the house. Come, come, come. You will leave whatever you are doing and you jump back to where, where you must be. So this drum language are very critical. And, and, and as a dancer and as an artist and as an upcoming scholar, there's a lot of work to be done. As, as I, 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 I'm demonstrating, we need to really pay attention to all these angles, irrespective of what we're going through. And we dance and we do that. I will crush my enemies when they come at me. I'm communicating. But we need cultured ear and cultured eye to understand what I'm talking about. Now, I don't have time for us to go do a little uh, demonstration. Uh, if you don't mind, I know we are in our, in our, in our homes. Abu! Amen. 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 So let me share the music and then we'll just a little other about the dance and then uh, questions and answers will be welcomed. Thank you so much. Before you begin to dance, you must ask permission from the elders. So you see Mama Karamu always say we go and thank our drummers first, touch the ground, our chest and the floor and all that. It's done, it's very cultural. So you can't just jump into dancing, give, 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 give. You'll be stuck from the dancing hall. You say, get out. So you ask permission. And that's how you do that movement. <laughs> So before you dance in the dancing arena, you locate people in social hierarchy, as I talk about, as anti-cosmology. You go the, the king first, or the elders, and from there to the drummers, before you come and start your dance. Because the space is very political. You can't just jump before any angle and just, just keep dancing. You must pay homage to all these powers, and, 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 and territory within your space. And then so we go, you ask permission. It depends on the context of this dance, the Kete dance. Is it under funeral? Is it under um, festival? Is it during ceremonial event? Because every contest comes with its own movement, vocabularies. You could see it was just uh, kind of a funeral with what you are wearing. So we go. <coughs> That's right, that's good. Ha, ha, ha. There you go. See the king. He said, thank you, congratulations. I like what you are doing. I'm endorsing you. When a king does this, Oh, that's, that, that's a lottery. You won a lottery. 
I mean, he has approved what you are doing. So just sticking your two fingers, it's not just, oh, peace up. No, it goes beyond just the gesture. He said, now go ahead. I've endorsed you. Dance to ancestors. Right, tell our story. Recount our story. I'm all ears. What are you just doing? <laughs> From the east and the west, all Pablo to the king. Gang, 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 gang. He's not a little boy, he's little. But culturally, he's danced, he's multi layered. As scholars, we should pay attention to everybody when you're researching. You want to estimate their age? Oh, he's small. He has a lot of information. <laughs> Pay attention to the mouth of the child. We will strike everyone that will interfere with our, with our ethnic group. Nobody. We are guarded. We are prepared for war. That's what the guys are doing. We went to the queen mother. Let him pay attention. Women have the same power like the, the chiefs in a central society. When a chief is not there, the queen mother can take every decision by herself. But the king can never take a decision without consulting the queen mother. The queen mother must approve every decision the king takes. And that shows how powerful Asante, uh, uh, see women. But that might be different from other, other cultures. So when you hear people talking about women are passive agents and they're not organized, I, when I hear such comments, uh, I begin to wonder wh where you read from or what is your basis? Because as I've left this thing from logical point of view, and it's happening. I'm not just a street boy. I grew up within the cultural parameters in their palace. And certain things which are not privy to ordinary people, I've got privy to them. And so I have a lot of things on my shoulder to make sure that, or to contribute to how we must really reassess the way we contribute to our dances. So on this note, thank you so much for your time. And I'm ready for any questions and answers. Thank you so much. Thank you, thank you, thank you so much, um, so much, so much for for all of that. And it's it's also interesting because this this presentation took a different format. It was very slightly academic, but um, accessible, um, and I think very necessary as we continue to talk about not only dance, the physical act of moving, um, but dance writing, choreography, um, histories, culture. Um, storytelling and, and all those things was really nicely um, wrapped up into your, your your presentation. I would love for you to you know share it with us if you if you so desire. If you can do that, um, I know it's your intellectual property, but I think um, just to have it in our data bank to use or to share with people um, if they ask for it. Um, but it's something that you said that I want you to speak a little bit more on for me. And I, I don't know if you 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 remember, but you talked about. Um, refraining from sticking to the pathways mapped out by colonial or neo-colonial structures. I have an idea and understanding of what that is and what that looks like and how it shows up, but can you um, expand on that for me, um, your time in America or in Europe, or South, South America, what that looks like and, 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 and in saying that, how can it help to actually move towards the decolonial agenda? Thank you so much for the question. Uh, as I said earlier on, after my undergrad, I felt less as a Ghanaian. It was a curriculum. I knew more about other cultures from theater, Europe, Greece, America, Southern America, a lot. And, and for me, coming from that background, I wanted to really find my voice and also make sure that uh, I help other colleagues because I knew I'll be, I'll be holding the, uh, the torch 
uh, in dance. So I, I made sure that I would try to get more knowledge. Going to Europe was very, very intense for me because over there, we are given specific tools to use for our dances. Lab notation, you might use lab notation system to document the dance. And you might use concept from classical anthropology, this concept from that and that and that. And I was okay with that. I was, I was learning a lot of stuff. But the more I read, the more I lose interest. Was I'm trying to fit as, as like this stuff and around the hole. And it's, it's not working for me, you know, like it's not working for me. This, you know, and I, I asked questions and I was apprehended. I, I was called to the office to ask a question why I asked that question. Why was I saying that they should look at other forms of knowledge? Because I was interrogating that we here to study only European dance forms. I want to be clear. As we are having Indians, Africans, Southern Americans, Americans, people from Australia, we come from across the globe. And so I was really concerned about how they can not appease us, but give us a leverage that we can all relate to. And to reassess the, and, and I was told that, okay, we can, we can look at scholarship that are written by non-Africans about African dance. I said, how? Why don't I look for scholarship written by Africans as well, or Mexicans, or, or, or trying from Jamaica, or Trinidad, and let's see perspectives. And so that was the turning point for me to really dig and look for ways I can really write down from my own perspective. And for, for example, my, 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 my undergrad course, what is your theoretical framework? Theoretical framework? Uh, you must come with theories before you start doing the work. And, and I was wondering, where are the theories? And they say, oh, look at these theories. They point me to so many directions. When I read these theories, they are good. But looking at the dance I'm look, talking about, it doesn't connect. Because it silences the voice. It silent, doesn't bring the full potential that I'm talking about. And that was a conflict I, 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 was, I, was, I was having. And, and through my career, I was Asante, my so rest in perfect peace, and Malefica Asante, they gave me hope that there are other ways that we can look at African dance from that perspective. And that's why I'm harnessing Afrocentricity. So in my own view, I think I'm not saying that uh, people cannot use other non-African methods. They are there, but let's give voice to other parts. They are there, they are not lost. Let's go after them, thank you. I think what you just said, thank you so much for that, is an echo of what my grad school experience was, right? And I, I became a dance writer, I guess, because there was something missing. There was something missing on the page. There was something missing in the language. There was something missing in the, in the, in the, in the, in the desire to write about only certain things. And so I became a writer because I felt like out of necessity, I had to put myself in the center so that I can expand on what was missing. That being said, or, or not that being said, but I think it's really important to understand that the, the, the wealth of knowledge that exists with European scholars, with white scholars, is really robust and rich, but that's not the only scholarship that exists. And exactly. that's my point. I think we have two questions, one from Eric and then one from Juan. Yes, thank you very much, uh, Gregory. C can, can everybody hear me? Okay, so uh, uh, thank you, Mr. Kuzo, for your presentation. I just wanted to, um, um, say something small about the question you asked, Gregory, and contribute to, Kujo has already said that, uh, answered the question, but when we also look at the colonial legacy of education in Africa, um, we must come to understand that uh, the education that was set up through institutions like universities and colleges were um, antagonistic to um, African knowledge systems the education that we get, embodied education that we get from our villages, our parents, and from the history. And so in the history of Ghanaian dance scholarship, for example, when the Ghana Dance Ensemble was set up in 1962, there was a resistance from Ghanaians in the university at the time who didn't really understand why uh, people should be admitted to the university to dance. And they found the plain these are Ghanaians, these are Africans. They found the playing of drums as a nuisance because they were disconnected. So I really um, 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 understood the, the, the lynched scholar position that 
um, Molefe was talking about, because even within the continent, the effect of colonial occupation and the structures that still exist today continue to redefine our uh, understanding of um, um, scholarship. So I, I, I am really happy that um, focus was turned to the African dancing body, the black dancing body, as, as a source of wisdom, as a source of knowledge that we can draw from within to explore our own experiences, to give our, we, we cannot give the black dancing body a voice with a, another voice from any other continent. We can only speak to our own. We can only express ourselves from our body. And we must understand that in African philosophy, or Ashanti philosophy, as Kujo mentioned, the body is a tripartite uh, um, combination. The spirit, the soul, and the flesh. The flesh is just one third of the full body. The soul and the spirit is a spiritual uh, source that draws from the atmosphere, that draws from the history. And we don't just enact the movement just as we did in the flesh. We tap from deeper sources of uh, spiritual knowledge. And these are existing knowledges that are there that, um, for example, his research is exploring, that we must stand on and push the knowledge system for, for not for just for world validation, but for validation of our own people. Thank you so much. For the, thank you so much for that. Um, inserting that into the space as well. I think that was really rich and, and well said. Thank you, Eric. Um, Juan? Yes, hello, Emmanuel. Thank you very much for your presentation. It's been very nice to, to listen to. Um, and you, uh, usually, I, I don't find very convincing the use of the term decolonization. But the case that you've uh, given for Africa eh, possibility for me. <laughs> so in that sense, I like that. Because it does make sense in the case of, of African heritage of our heritage and our practices only in terms of um, Western paradigms. Being said, uh, it is very, uh, your, your background is very interesting because you've, uh, for example, you quoted uh, De Diminas Caroblis and Egil Baca when you mentioned the, these notions of dance concept and dance realization, right? And you were to decolonize both the concept and the realization. And, and this notion of concept of realization can, can be dated back to Aristotle, right? With potentiality and actuality. So this is as wide as it gets. And that means that it, that it is not useful. So that is for me uh, the question that I would like to pose to you. How do you view this uh, deploying uh, an African paradigm to understand African dance? But how does that integrate? with an already robust framework from the Western side. <clears throat> I had, the line was breaking a little bit. Can you say that again? I just want to be sure I had it correctly, the question. Yeah, sorry, no, my question was, how can you integrate for the, from the Western side into this project, which I deem very valuable of, um, let us say, Africanizing dance from Africa, right? Um, acknowledging that we already have a useful a conceptual frame from from Europe. <clears throat> yeah, uh, thank you so much. I want to say a question from, I want to thank uh, Juan. Uh, he was my administrator in Europe for my program, second master's. And I know, I know him a lot, yes, he will go way back. Uh, I'll answer you from an embodiment point of view. We embody dance from many perspectives. There's no only one way. And that is why uh, as a as dance scholar, you see the concept of realization I embodied using concept of realization uh, as a kind of uh, leverage in paying homage to knowledge that exists not in a performance paradigm. And so to go deeper, I'm trying to say that you can embody, yes, realization, the practical, the concept is the knowledge. That's not the only alternative way of trying to talk about other people's dance. Yes, Western stru structures are very solid. That one, there's no choice about that. Very solid. And the issue is somebody build that structure based on their experience. Somebody build that structure based on their lived experiences. 
For example, if you join a train from Peru to maybe Brazil, if you know, if, if you are a captain or you are not riding the train from Peru to Brazil, you know your destination. But if I join in the middle, I might guess where the train is leading to. So, so why did I use this uh, analogy? Is that even though I'm not, I'm not trying to relegate or negate other way of embodiment, it's very, it's very, very important. In my work, I'm using both, but I'm highlighting 95% of African American scholars scholarship in my writing, intentionally, because I realize that that is what is being silenced. And I'm, I'm not, I'm not. You see, the Western structures overshadowed Africa, the African, because of imperialistic position or the determinant of existing African knowledge. These are very clear. Let me repeat that. The Western structures overshadow the African experience because of its imperialistic position to the detriment of the African knowledge. So using conceptualization is not denouncing European scholarship, but highlighting the shared bodily experience. I don't know if I've answered the question. So I like, like that very much. Yes, yes you did. <laughs> Thank you, Emmanuel. Big <laughs> Humphrey. I think you have, um, Emmanuel, and you've also given us um, uh, an open door into this, what, what, what higher ed is now for, for most of us, right? There are certain things that students have to learn to matriculate, and most of these things are rooted in Euro Eurocentricism. And so I, I think as we continue to figure out these Western structures that we have to exist in as budding scholars, as students, as thinking minds, we have to push back, right? Ask why, ask how, ask, what's, ask about what's missing so that we can continue to expand the knowledge that we know is out there. Um, someone have their hand up, but then put it down. Okay, any, any other questions, anything percolating, ruminating on your minds? Anything that stood out to you in the presentation that you would like to address, question, double down on, ask for clarifications on? No, well, I do have a question. I didn't want to take up too much space. Um, so uh, Emmanuel, and this is gonna be a little basic, but I do believe it, it, it just needs to be, be talked about a little bit. Um, where are you in your work towards a decolonial dance practice or decol decolonizing dance practices? Where are you in your work, your personal work? Emmanuel, you're muted. Can you hear me? Now we can, yes. Yes. I'm at the point of highlighting experiences of the dancing body. Okay. That I, 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 I gathered for my data when I went to Ghana this summer. So, uh, and I realized that uh, there were more information that I underestimated when uh, I got to the field and I, I was interviewing the chief in charge of a Tomb Force Kitty. And there I was schooled actually again. And that's why it was really interesting to really sit back and really reflect more and look at how I can really uh, peel out the layers and really come up very strong with my, with my views. And so, um, as I said, I'm on the point of highlighting experiences of, of, of the dancing body. Okay, thank you for that. Um, and, and yes, this is a yes or no question, but I want you to go broad. Should dance programs within academic structures engage in decolonizing or decolonial practices? And what needs to happen for dance in the academy to be experienced through a decolonized lens? Thank you so much. Um, as I said about, I'm learning more about like my body and our fathers and our mother's bodies and how they shape my position of movement now. And to really suggest that the academy to really look at how we can colonize dance is very broad. Yes, I agree. From my, my own perspective, in Ghana, we have uh, the categories, traditional, amateur, professional, and academy. These are the blocks in Ghana. They should identify these pathways and the categories. And so if I am at the school performing and learning dance, 
I am arguing that they should bring in other, other categories to come and help with my transmission process. For example, they engage the Canada company to come in, have workshop with us. They can call for amateur dance companies to come in to come and help us in teaching. And we must take trips to the villages or where the dance come from to experience the so-called authentic way as well. That's from, from a Ghanaian perspective. But to decolonize dance in academy, we must explore these nuances and let our students understand how movements serve the needs of other people. And this summer, I took students to Ghana from my own pocket, from my own pocket, my own money. I was teaching them in, in class and they said, Kuja, I want to follow you to Ghana. I said, okay. And I sponsored them for a whole month in Ghana. Uh, I, I, I sent them to dance class, theater dance class, music class. They explore hugely. And when I, I saw them back at Temple, when they are talking, it's very different. Mm -hmm. but because they've experienced other version of what I taught in the studio. And I must say that the studio limits us because you have a semester, you must see two dances. So you rush through the dances, you don't pay attention to what the details of the dance. And so one, one way we can really look at the time from teaching the dance in the academy. Like maybe one in a one in a semester, we can we can have time to deal with all these things. Not like can you teach three in three months? I see it's like, like like cooking a food or making a dish, like in a very fast pace. Okay, I'm done. The next one. When we do, keep doing that, we keep limiting the dance knowledge. And so in my approach to teaching at Temple, before I teach the dance, I begin with a concept. Why you are doing this? A meaning behind that. Why you do that? Why you do that? And I try to get curious. Wow, I didn't know. I learned this down from this place, from that place. I wasn't told about it. I said, yes, that's their form of teaching. But for me, I'm deploying the knowing and the knowledge concept. If you know something, you have experienced it. You have knowledge of it, you have information about these things. If you experience a dance, you have different embodiment level as compared to someone who have read about the dance. And so the academy must embrace all these nuances. We want to colonize our dance in, in academy. We must share, we must share classes. We must engage priests, chiefs, drummers, drum makers to understand what, what the relevance of the dance to African identity politics. So we must have, bring these dancers in, chief priests in, drummers to tell their story. I deploy my drummers in class, Baba Yibo, Baba Jo. I let them speak, even though I'm an instructor. I let them speak when we are doing drum workshop. They speak from the embodied activities. And the student love it a lot. They comment, oh, I didn't know when you do that, it means that. And I said, yeah, because they are drumming it. They can talk about it more. So in decolonizing the dance, they are, they, are, they are multi layered. There are so many angles. From Ghanaian perspective, we might deploy all the categories. In the diaspora, we must not be too quick to claim aspects of what we have, we have experienced in one month or two months. That can help with the decolonization perspective. Or you go to Africa for one month and you're doing workshop, it's very important, but be very careful when you are a certain authority about that dance. The people, oh, I learned about this dance. I'm gonna look at the kind of, oh, this, uh, this has been watched now. But the person was not clear to tell them, okay, this version of this I'm teaching you. But I see, oh, this is a perfect one. And so that was the issue that I'm dealing with. We must not do quick to claim mastery when we just raise like three weeks or one month. Right. Because it's a long life journey. And we must connect, we, we have learned about it, but we shouldn't claim it as uh, we have it, like as if we have it all within one month. I'm still learning it, thank you so much. I think that's probably why I have an issue with the term masterclass or master. <laughs> I, like, you know what is master, sit down. Um, but anyway, I, I, I want to, you know, offer the space for one more voice before we wrap up. Um, I want to talk about the next phase of this project for me and what I'm thinking of doing with the, the, the works that have been written and the presentations that we've had. But I'm just going to leave the space open a little bit for anyone who would like to say something before I prate. Don't all yell now. Uh, Professor Santi, do you have anything to say? Professor Santi. <laughs> well, since.
everyone in silence, can I just ask one more question? <laughs> yeah, go ahead. Go ahead. Yeah made reference to semiotics and that turns me like well, my radar turns on so uh and i would like you to elaborate a little bit on that like how you conceive um of the of the asante dances as uh, semiotic systems what do you mean by that okay so semiotics as you said yeah science and symbols that are deployed by the dancing body so as, as i was talking about the uh the holistic nature of of of, of the dance from Kuvo. The, dance, the body, the music, the, the multisensory modality, and, and, and the visual forms. These are aesthetic elements, and these are semiotics. For example, if you see a dancer with a sword and a gun, they, they have meanings. You hold, the, you hold the, the gun with your right hand and the sword with your left hand. And that is where this movement comes from. I'll defend myself with the gun and defend myself with the sword when the king is doing that. But if you're not a king and you're dancing, you can't hold a sword and, and, and a gun. You use your hand to do it. So these are signs. And also looking at the costume I spoke about, signs and symbols. Uh, uh, when you see someone wearing black and performing kitty, it's a grave moment. And you can't go there to be so excited about what is happening. You must be in the mood with them. For example, when you see, as I spoke about the drum, the cover, the black and red, is a sign that uh, this drum that you are playing has been through many, many layers of, of, of blood and people are losing their lives. So when you're playing that drum, I have this consciousness. I was chanting some songs. Uh, when the Otun for the king hears these songs, uh, it helps him to be in a rightful state of mind to rule his people. So semiotics helps us understand why things are, these things are the way they are. And so um, the holistic nature of dance gives us insight into thought patterns and meaning making process. So that's the semiotic element uh, to, uh, for me. Uh, you can't just, as I said about the aquafina, the sword, um, the gesture, if I do this in my, in my dancing, biting my tongue, it means I'm in pain. It's a sign that I'm in pain. If I'm dancing and I'm, I do this, my mouth, I'm not happy with what is happening. When I'm dancing and I'm, I'm doing this, I will survive any arrow thrown at me. And these are signs and symbols that we need to investigate the meanings and why they are in, in, in the dance. With the music, the drum language, that's a huge book on its own because a, a, a drum is a surrogate instrument. It can replace a human being. But what I was saying can be played on the drum. And so the master drama is not just somebody trying to make music. It's a representation of the ancestors. It's a, a mediator of the ancestors, the spirit world to the physical world. Because so when you see a master drama drumming the tumpan, at that time, it's not, if it's called Baba Joe, that was not Baba Joe at that time. It's a different persona, double identity at display at that time. The God rhythms comes to him by divine inspiration. And when you get possessed, I don't go there now, when you get possessed, that's where we retrieve our lost movement. Because when possession comes in and you lose the movement, and it happened to me before, and I was told, hey, Emmanuel, get here. This movement used to be part of the dance, but it's gone for very long. I didn't know about it. It took a 90-year-old woman to tell me. I didn't know. I wasn't born. So possession is also a way of retrieving information during the performance of Kitty. Not like, oh, you just possess, spirit taken over. It goes beyond that. So Simeon, as I said, uh, it helps in understanding what we are doing and you know, what we do. Thank you so much, Juan. Thank you. And in the interest of time, I just I just want to say it's also interesting. 
earlier you talked about um you know not, not jamming everything into one semester or one yep. you just jammed a whole bunch into one presentation yep. um but i am grateful that we were able to share the zoom space and just to to, to just talk about my the next phase of this project so this started with an idea i had this i was wanting to expand um this uh, dance knowledge and so we had five um artists five amazing artists from peru sri lanka uh, colombia new zealand and the ghana and we had two writers um write a writer attached to each um artist and a writer wrote two pieces for um the thinking dance website platform and it was an interview accompanied by um an, an expository 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 piece um, to expose exactly what the, the the writer's thoughts were, what the the practitioner was was giving giving in terms of generosity, um, just so that people can be a little bit more get, get a little bit more about their their, their um, actual practice, and so ten pieces in all were written from this project. Uh, next summer, I am working with a think tank to figure out ways to create some um, uh, uh, curriculum map to help with dance history so from each from each artist there will be a, a a title of sorts and so we will work together to get uh maybe be whether it be i don't know research questions whether it be uh, activities whether it be um, prompts to move forward to see how we can expand these conversations around dance and dance history with the western lens versus the decolonized lens because i think something is missing from dance history in, in higher ed and so maybe this project will start a conversation maybe it will serve as a catalyst and then we'll take it further L let's see how interested um institutions and dance programs and and teachers and writers are in ensuring that this conversation continues i want to say thank you to everyone who was able to make this happen i'm um, critical minded where we got the grant from um thinking dance the platform that hosted this all the artists all the writers graciela kenwin kalila it was an amazing experience for the last five months engaging planning well, no that planning part wasn't so hot but um it all happened and we survived to talk about it thank you all so much and i'm just gonna have graciela have the last word um big shout out to gregory like honestly gregory put so much dream space and love and labor into this whole process so thank you gregory for dreaming up this idea and inviting us all into it um thank you to our artists thank you thinking dance um and also just thank you everyone for continuing to show up it's been so nice like building community with folks um there are some folks who we you know have met throughout this process who have stayed with us throughout the entire process you know recognizing names as we continue to go there are some folks who it this might be their new one but it's nice to also like be building our thinking dance community um and i'm just excited for next steps and hope that folks return to this next iteration that Gregory's talking about. Let's keep dancing, y'all. Thank you for sharing your Saturday afternoon with us. Have a wonderful day. Go drink your wine. And eat your rum. Thank you, Emmanuel. Thank you, King. Okay. Yes, <laughs> yes. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you so much. Of course. Thank you so much, love. Thank you, Elizabeth. Thank you for coming. <laughs>